morning we're continuing and completing our study of the Beatitudes. We started last week. We took a look at the first four. We're going to take a look at the remaining five. Now, some of you are saying, I saw the quiz. There's only eight. There's only eight. 
Now, there's nine blesseds. The last two are so close and similar that we cover those together. We'll do that in just a moment, picking up where we left off last Sunday morning. But as always, before we talk about the Son, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to his Father first. Father, we come before you grateful, thankful that you would allow us to come. Thankful for the freedoms that we have in this country that we celebrate at the end of this week. We come praying for our country, praying for our leaders, praying for the upcoming election next year. We pray for godly men and godly women to step into those positions of office so they can get us back to where we were founded upon one foundation, which is you, one nation under God, on biblical scriptural principles so that we can teach our children and their children the way that you taught us. As we open your word this morning, we ask you to come in a powerful way. We pray for the one who teaches, Father, that you would forgive him his sins, for they are many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. First 12 verses of chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus sits down. He has some important things to say, and this is what he says. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, if you weren't here last Sunday morning, there are a couple of prerequisites that you need to know before we finish up our teaching on the Beatitudes. First, these teachings and the Beatitudes are not a set of laws or commandments for a Christian to live by. If you use these nine traits to beat your Christian brothers and sisters over the head with, or to go out and judge pagans with, or to go on a guilt trip yourself with, then you've simply missed the point of this wonderful teaching. These teachings give the Christian a, a code of character by which you measure your progress and your efforts to be more like Jesus. The attitudes are constructed in a way that gives us a present reality and a future hope. A present reality, the first line. A future hope, the second line. As we studied last week. Blessed are those who mourn. Present reality, first line. For they will be comforted. Future hope, second line. You need to know that these nine promises of future hope are not something you earn, not something that you hustle for. But they are gifts from a perfect father. And finally, we need to understand the meaning of the word blessed. And translated from the Greek, it means the highest form of happiness or togetherness experienced only by the gods. And then the Hebrew connotation meant congratulations, happy and congratulations. For instance, Jesus says, as we just said, congratulations, happy are you who mourn, present reality, for you will be comforted, and that is the future hope. Last week, we looked at the first four, poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and those things in mind. Let's take a look at the remaining five this morning. The fifth beatitude, Jesus talks about congratulations to the merciful. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Let me give you a parallel text of this verse, Matthew six fourteen. 
It's the verse that follows Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer. Listen to what it says about equality and fairness. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. In other words, forgiveness is conditional. It is not automatic. As I've said many times before, we are dealing with a very much more than fair God. The Father is going to judge you with the same amount of mercy that you use to judge others. What's that mean to you? That means that if you go around looking at everybody else through a microscope with a hammer in your hand, God's going to do exactly the same with you. If you go around loving and merciful, God's going to look exactly the same way at you. How do I know that? Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Judge not lest you be judged, for the measure you use unto others will be dealt unto you. Why do you look at a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when all the time you have a plank in your own eye? Now, in order to properly understand this particular beatitude, there are some prerequisites that we need to understand. So stay with me. First, mercy presupposes that you have been wronged. You know, there is among many Christians a, a poly, Pollyanna-ish attitude that seems to suggest that most people are just really good at heart. And when bad things are done towards you that they really meant well, they just messed up. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, that simply is not true. There are mean people in this world, and to be honest, you're one of them. There are calculating people in this world, and you are one of those. There are people who do cruel things from time to time, and you are one of those. I have a friend who lives in Tennessee <laughs> who grew up thinking Elvis Presley was the greatest thing that ever happened to United States history. He just loves Elvis. He collects everything from Elvis. He's got all of his records, all of his movies, all the memorabilia. He goes to Graceland once a year. He has a, a little boy. Not too long ago, he acted up at the supper table. He corrected him. He acted up a second time. And he said to him, you do that one more time, and you're going to go to your room without any supper. And for the third time, the little boy acted up. Now, in that house, you didn't question the authority of Dad. But he did allow you to have an opinion. And so on the way to his room, he said, Dad, and his dad said, yes, son. He said, I just want you to know that I think Elvis Presley stinks. <laughs> Well, you say he's just a little boy, and little boys are wont to do things like that. Let me tell you something. Big boys and big girls are wont to do things like that too. Why? Because we're a fallen people living in a fallen world. So I want you to start by understanding that mercy is irrelevant unless people do bad things to you for bad reasons. And then secondly, the beatitude presupposes that you have the means to get even. Listen, mercy is a myth if you can't get even. And say it again. Mercy is a myth if you can't get even. I mean, if you don't have the gun pointed at the face saying, make my day, then mercy is irrelevant because you can't put the gun away and show mercy. Right after we built a new home in Atlanta, that house was broken into and robbed. I was in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada, over 3,000 miles away. The phone rang. It was love. She'd come home from church. Her and the boys had been to Wednesday night Bible study. She found that the house had been broken into. They stole all of her expensive jewelry. They stole a gun that my father had given me, all my police badges. The gun was loaded. I remember praying in the hotel room that they would shoot themselves before the night was over. I want you to know that if I could have gotten my hands on them, I would have taken care of them. If I could have just found out who they were, I would have gone and I would have taken care of it. But I want you to know that mercy was irrelevant in that situation because I couldn't get my hands on them. I didn't know who they were. The police never found my gun, never found my badges, never found love's jewelry, and so I never had the chance to get even. So we need to understand that mercy didn't pertain in that particular instance. When we lived in Chicago, Love and I and the boys, two older boys, were rear-ended one Sunday morning after church on our way to a restaurant for Mother's Day. We were getting ready to turn. I had the left turn signal on. There was no turn lane there. We were at a green light waiting for oncoming traffic to pass. There was a BMW in front of me, and I looked in the rearview mirror. 
And here came a big old Oldsmobile just barreling down. And I looked, and there was a young girl driving, and I knew she wasn't going to get stopped in time. In fact, I don't think she put on the brakes much before she hit the back of our car. Right before the impact, I yelled and told everybody that we were going to get hit. They leaned back, put their head against the headrest, which really helped out a lot because it destroyed the back end of my company car. It knocked us forward, and we tapped, I'm talking tapped, the bumper of the BMW. Just a little tink. That was all. No chrome exchange, no paint exchange, just tink. I looked in the rearview mirror. I saw the girl leaning over the steering wheel. I looked around at my family to see if they were okay, and they were okay. The woman in the BMW, she couldn't move. She couldn't get out of the car. She called an ambulance. They put the neck brace on her, put her in an ambulance, took her, and she ended up suing our company uh, for injuries. And after I saw that my family was okay, I opened the door, and I ran back, and this 16-year-old girl had her license four days, had her dad's brand-new car, and she plowed into the back of us. Her forehead was cut from where she'd hit the steering wheel. This was back before the days of cell phones. I had a car phone in my company car. I let her use it to call her dad. She stayed with us until he got there. After it was over, I thought, you know, that's one for me. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be shown at least a little bit of mercy. Because you see, at that particular point, I could have done what the lady in the BMW did. I could have limped out and held my neck. I had the opportunity to get even, but I didn't. Thirdly, mercy presupposes that when you're wronged, you will do the appropriate thing. I want to read you what Barclay, his commentary, how it translates this particular beatitude. Listen to this. Oh, the bliss of the man who gets right inside other people until he can see with their eyes, think their thoughts, feel with their feelings. For he who does that finds others will do the same for him and will know that that is what God in Jesus Christ has done. So that means that if you get inside someone, you understand their motives, that you should always just smile when you're wronged and pretend that it didn't happen, right? Wrong. That's not always proper mercy. It means that if you get inside someone and you understand their motives, that you'll do the right thing mercifully, and sometimes that means calling the police. Sometimes that means saying no for their own good. Sometimes that means saying, I will not be manipulated by you again because it wouldn't be good for you. So what does it mean to be merciful? It means getting inside somebody's skin, understanding why they did something, and then gauging the merciful reaction appropriately. Let me say it again. What does it mean to be merciful? It means getting inside somebody's skin, understanding why they did something, and then gauging the merciful reaction appropriately. And sometimes it's not rolling over and playing dead. Let me see if I can illustrate. When we were in Chicago, I had a service technician that worked for me, a very, very likable guy. His name was Lou. And I remember one time, I walked by the dispatcher, and I, I heard them dispatch a call to him. He went on the call, and then I remember him saying back over the radio, they don't want it fixed. Give me another one. We fix food processing machinery. He got a service call. He showed up. They don't want it fixed. Give me another call. I thought that was strange. I remember a day or two later, I heard the same thing. The following week, I heard it again, and then again. They don't want it fixed. Give me another call. I asked him about it. I said, what's the problem? These people are calling in wanting service, and you're not fixing their machine. Hey, I give them a prize. It's not my fault. They don't want it fixed. I went back in the computer. I found out that there had been a lot of those calls. And so I took them. I wrote down the names of the businesses and the addresses, and I got in my car the next day, and I did some investigating. I went to those businesses. I said, you called on such, such and such a day. What happened? They said, well, Lou, your employee, told me that he'd take care of it on his own. That he'd come by on his way home from work and, and he'd fix it. Or he'd come by on a Saturday or a Sunday when he was off and, and he would fix it. We could deal with him. And I said, do you have a receipt from the company? He said, no, we always just paid him cash. 
I did some research into the types of machines that he fixed. There were thousands and thousands of dollars worth of parts out of our service truck that he used. I even found that he had a business card, and it was taped to some of their machines, and he'd been with us for five years. We don't know how long he was doing it. I called the service manager. I said, call Lou into the warehouse and fire him on the spot. Get his keys, lock his van. If he wants any personal items, tell him you'll send it to him. He did that, and all that afternoon and all the next day, the phone just kept ringing off the hook. He wanted to talk to me about getting his job back. I finally took the call. The secretary put it through. I said, I'll give you 15 minutes in the morning at 7 o'clock. He came in the next morning. I said, you're fired, and you will remain fired, and if you come here to change that, you're crazy. I said, I'll give you 15 minutes. I listened to him, and then I explained why and what I'd found out. I said, I'm not going to prosecute you. I'm not going to make you pay restitution for the thousands of dollars of parts and the man hours and the business that you stole from our company. But I want you to know that you're still fired. Now get out of my office. Folks, that is biblical mercy in the way that Jesus describes it here. What is it to be merciful? Getting inside somebody's skin, understanding why they did something, gauging the merciful reaction appropriately. And then finally on mercy, the beatitude presupposes that you'll recognize your own need for mercy. You know, when you get inside of the skin of your adversary, you know what you discover? You discover that you're a whole lot like your adversary. There are people sitting here this morning looking across the room saying, man, I wish I had it together like those people over there. Look at them. I saw them standing up worshiping. I see them with their Bibles open now. I wish I had it together like they have it together. But look at me. I mean, my life is just full of guilt and sin and problems. Let me tell you something. Those folks across the room that you're looking at, they don't have it together either. If you could see inside of them, you'd be shocked. They got all kinds of things inside that require mercy from God, just like you. And when you get inside somebody else's skin, you find out they're a whole lot like you. When you show mercy, you're not a good person bestowing love upon your enemy. You're a bad person who recognizes that it could have been you. Right? When you show mercy, you're not a good person bestowing love upon your enemy. You're a bad person who recognizes that it could have been you. And someday you'll need that mercy too. We've done this before. I want you to do it for me again. Right now, I want you to think about that person or those people who've done something bad to you. Get them in your mind. Somebody who's really gone after you. Got them in your mind? Secondly, think of the way that you're going to get them back. Get even. Get revenge. Got that in your mind? Now, let it go. For Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, let it go. And don't forget, the future hope, someday, God is going to show you that same mercy. All right, in the sixth beatitude, Jesus congratulates the pure in heart. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The word pure is used some 28 times in the New Testament. Ten of those times, it refers to linen or gold or glass. When it refers to linen, it means pure white linen. When it refers to gold, it means pure unalloyed gold. When it refers to glass, it means clear glass without any impurities in it. But by far, when the word pure is used in the New Testament, it refers to rightness and singleness of heart. Rightness and singleness of heart. When you use the word heart among the Jews, it didn't just mean the seat of the emotions. It meant the essence of everything that you are. So what was Jesus saying? He was saying the same thing as Kierkegaard, the first existentialist, was saying. That purity of heart is to will one thing. Purity of heart is to will one thing. You want to see God? Then you will see God when you want to see him with all of your heart. A young man came to Socrates one time. He said he was searching for truth. Socrates took him down to the river, held him under the water until he struggled for air, and he let him up just before he drowned. And then Socrates said, Son, when you want truth the way that you just wanted air, then you will have truth. Why? 
purity of heart is to will one thing. You can will a lot of things in your life, but purity of heart will be to will one thing, and that will be God. Let me give you a principle. You are what you've decided to be. You are what you've decided to be. In other words, you think what you've decided to think. You understand what you've decided to understand. And you see what you've decided to see. The point is this. What do you want to see? What do you want to be? What do you want to know? What do you want to understand? When you decide, and I mean decide with all of your heart, then you'll have that. Singleness of heart is to will one thing. I turned 62 back in February. And at 62, there are a lot of things that aren't as big as they once were in my life. There was a time when I wanted to be rich and successful. I suppose I still do occasionally. There was a time when I wanted to be an evangelist and travel around the country, seeing thousands of people come to know Christ. And occasionally, when I get discouraged around here, I probably still will feel that way. There was a time when I wanted to write a great book that would be read by a large audience that would really help people. And I guess I still hope for things like that sometimes. But the older I get, the less important those things have become. Because I'm putting away self. And the most important thing in my life is that I see God when this life is over. That's why God is more real to me now than he used to be. And when I want to see him with all of my heart, when that's the central thrust of my desire, then I shall see God. I've been promised. You ever met a a multi-talented person who was a failure? You know, I've met lots of them. And the reason they're a failure is because they couldn't decide on one thing. Often the person with that one gift, that one talent, is the successful person because they desire and will for their life that one thing. Now, let me tell you something. If you desire it, you will probably get it with all of your heart. If you make that one thing the central focal point and desire of your life, you will have it. If you want to see God with all of your heart and desire and dedicate your life to that purpose, then you will see God. But be careful because it works in reverse. Be careful because it works in the bad things of life too. If you want to be rich with all of your heart, you're going to be rich. But you may have to sell your soul to get there. If you want to be loved by everybody, then you can be loved by everybody. But you'll have to compromise your principles to get there. Because you can will singleness of heart one thing and you can get it. And for that reason, folks, hell is full of people who wanted to go there with all of their heart. Say it again. Hell is full of people who wanted to go there with all of their heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. All right, then the seventh beatitude. Jesus congratulates the peacemakers. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. You know, if a man resolves conflict, he's not a peacemaker, he's a diplomat. A peacemaker not only resolves conflict, but then he goes out and he stirs up unity and love and camaraderie and peace. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers. Let me give you a principle, and it's important. Only peaceful people can be peacemakers. Say it again. Only peaceful people can be peacemakers. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer was the inventor of the atomic bomb. And he was asked by a congressional committee, Dr. Oppenheimer, is there any defense against the atomic bomb? And he said, yes, gentlemen, there is one, and that is peace. Peace takes place where there are peaceful people. Our home, because of my wife, Love, is a peaceful place. If you know Love, she's calm, secure, peaceful. She has that peaceful way about her, and it permeates our entire house. When our two older boys were growing up, Our house was always full of teenagers. Sometimes I got so tired of it. But we just loved them and fed them and fed them and loved them and fed them and fed them. 
And they would say, you know, we just love being here. There's something about your house. There wasn't anything about our house. It was the home that the piece of my wife had made our house into. Stevie's in college now, and when he comes home on weekends, he brings two or three friends with him. And we love them and feed them and feed them and love them and feed them. And they say, you know, we just love being here. There's just something about your house. There's nothing about our house. It's the home that the piece of my wife has made it into. Now, I wasn't that way in the beginning. I used to have a horrible temper and anger problem. I was explosive, got upset. When we were in Chicago, I was the poster boy for road rage. But when I walked through the door, there was a sense of peace in our home that you couldn't ignore and you couldn't believe. And now both of us permeate a peace in our home because I learned it from a peaceful person. You've got to get next to a peaceful person if you want peace. But I want you to know it takes hard work to be a peaceful person. November 27th coming up will mark the 120th anniversary of Albert Nobel's will. It's commemorated because of the vast fortune he amassed during his life that was set up to honor those whose efforts for peace in the world were outstanding. Millions of dollars have been given away in the last 120 years because he gave his fortune to be set up for awards for peace. Do you know what Albert Nobel's fortune came from? He was the inventor of dynamite, TNT, and other explosives used in bombs. The inventor of dynamite and explosives, Albert Nobel, set up a Nobel Peace Prize. You see, those who get close to war understand the need for peacemakers. Do you like to stir up conflict? Then you need to stay away from it. If you enjoy conflict, you've got a long way to go to be a peacemaker. If you're that kind of person, you need to remember God's not finished with you yet either. You've got to get next to somebody who's peaceful. My wife is good, but Jesus is a whole lot better. Jesus said you need to be a peacemaker. And if you're not, get around someone who is and learn it. All right, finally. The eighth and ninth Beatitudes, we look at those together because they say similar things. Jesus says, congratulations if you suffer and you don't deserve it. Verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, Jesus says some strange things here about persecution. We face a different kind of persecution than his disciples faced. They all died as martyrs for their faith, with the exception of one. Our martyrdom is different. I remember when I baptized my friend Jim Rice, he became a Christian. He said to me, what I do about my pagan friends? I said, don't worry about it. He said, do I have to give them up? I said, just wait a while and they'll give you up. And that's what happened. You see, we're held up for derision. People laugh at our beliefs and our principles. They make fun of our faith and hope in something they can't understand or see. As my friend Steve Brown says, if everybody likes you, you simply haven't said it well enough or plain enough. You haven't said it in a way that your friends understood. If you stand... For God, you're going to be persecuted. And if you're persecuted, Jesus says, congratulations, because the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Let me give you a great verse from Acts chapter 5. The apostles had been beaten, taken before the Sanhedrin. As they lead, this is what Luke writes. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Christ. You know, there's something good about knowing that you're doing it right because people don't like what you're doing. You ever think about that? You ever feel that? Now, this doesn't say go out and be a twit for God. It just says when you stand and you're persecuted, great is your reward in heaven. John Wesley at one time in his ministry, after riding thousands of miles on horseback, he thought he was outside of the will of God. 
Very depressed, he got down off his horse, he knelt down and he prayed, God, what have I done wrong? Why am I outside of your will? And about that time, two ruffians came along and they threw a rock, a big rock, and it just missed his head and it landed beside him. And he looked up to heaven and he said, I praise you, God, that I am once again in your will and your pleasure. There's something about persecution that gives you the indication that you're doing it right. And Jesus ends this beatitude by saying that when you're persecuted, when you're slandered, when people say all kinds of evil against you because of him, you are a part of an esteemed company because the prophets got exactly the same treatment. Those who spoke forth for God before you got exactly the same treatment. I love the first verse of the 12th chapter of Hebrews. If you remember, the 11th chapter is the Heroes Hall of Fame. It's where all the people who did all the good things are listed. But the writer of Hebrews says in 12 verse 1, Therefore, after listing all those important people, Therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now the imagery here is a great stadium. And those people who are mentioned in Hebrews 11, they're in the stands in the stadium, and we're down on the playing field. They're watching us. And they're cheering us on. As it begins to cost us in our stand and in our Christian walk, they're cheering us on. They're saying, go get them, Bill. And I look up sometimes and I say, Peter, you can identify with this. How am I doing? Not too good. I look up and I say, Amos, Amos, my brother, I got criticized today. You can relate to that, can't you, Amos? There is something wonderful about being persecuted and being in the company of Rahab and Amos and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Moses and Jesus and Peter and Paul. I want you to know that's a great bunch of folks, and I live in the best of company, and you do too when you're persecuted. Matthew 5.11, that last beatitude. Let's read it again. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. You need a Matthew 5.11 file. I've had a Matthew 5.11 file for the last 28 years. Every time I'm persecuted, I take it and I file it in Matthew 5.11 file and rejoice because I've marked up another point with God. Again, let me stress, it doesn't say that you go out and be a twit for God. In the past 28 years, my family and I have been persecuted, criticized, laughed at, and made fun of. And I always hated it for love and for the boys. I hated it going through it. But there was a sense, whenever it happened, that I was doing what I'd been called to do because of Matthew 5.11. We've had death threats. We had seven Michelin tires slashed on our car. I don't know why they left the eighth one. We had shards of razor-sharp broken glass put into our car seats so that we would sit on them. We've gotten prank and obscene phone calls at all hours of the day and night. We got hateful and critical phone messages, emails, and letters. But my favorite was a 17-page typewritten letter telling me about all the people who were in hell because of the grace that I preached and why I was going to hell too. 17 pages. That's not hate mail. That's a manifesto. That's a small novel. Who would do that? And oddly enough, this very angry man ended his letter with this statement, and I'm quoting word for word. Last paragraph. Pastor, all I am is Balaam's donkey trying to get a message through. I agree with that 100%. And I would say more, but you know the King James translation. We are in the best of company when we're persecuted for the sake of God. Chalk up another point with God when it happens. But understand that we don't face what they faced 2,000 years ago. They haven't put me on a cross, driven nails through my hands and feet, a spear in my side or a crown of thorns on my head. And they haven't yours either. But realize that when we stand faithfully, he's going to stand with you. Let me finish with this. 
Alexander the Great was considered a very fair man. Once a month, he would take his throne. He would have it carried out into the courtyard, and he would sit on his throne, and he would judge minor offenses, especially military offenses that had taken place. He took care of his soldiers. One soldier who had been a soldier for him for 20 years was an officer, came before him, and he'd been falsely accused. Alexander listened to his case, and then he turned to an aide, and he said, Go with this man on my behalf and plead his case before the high court of magistrates. You be my character witness for him. And as the aide tried to take the soldier's arm to lead him away, he tore off his breastplate, he took off his shirt, and he showed his scars to Alexander. Scars on his neck, on his chest, on his arm from swords where he battled for 20 years. And the soldier said, Your Majesty, when your kingdom was in jeopardy, I did not send a substitute. I fought for you myself. Alexander the Great dismissed his court, had his throne taken back inside. And he went to the high court with his friend. That's the promise of Matthew 5.11 for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these codes of Christian character. I thank you that they're not ten more commandments, but a, a list of things that we can measure ourselves by in our efforts to be more like your son. I thank you for all of the positive aspects of the Beatitudes, the fact that when we're merciful, you're going to be merciful with us. It's such a, a balance and a scale with you. You're such a more than fair God. And as we live out this life, we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that you went to our auction and you bought us and you set us free. And that means that we're really free, that your grace is true and it's sufficient. And it's always there. We love you and we praise you for that. And we thank you for the freedoms that we have in this country. But most of all, we thank you for the freedom that we have in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.